White leftists are not our allies. They are not our accomplices. They are, they are not for liberation. They are for their own profit and um, for, you know, building their own social capital and positioning themselves as the experts, as the, you know, they're, you know, like the whole, this whole thing has just made me realize that like white people are not serious. Hi everyone. So I debated making this video because anti-white racism is not exactly an issue that deserves a ton of time and attention. Obviously, white people are not systemically oppressed. And I don't want to bolster the right-wing narrative that we are by dedicating an entire video to this topic. But then I thought about it some more, and I realized that letting blatant anti-white racism slide because talking about it is not a good look actually perpetuates white supremacy. Because in order to liberate people of color, we have to dismantle racism as a whole. Racism being the belief that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, or qualities, especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. We often hear that it's not possible to be racist against white people because racism is prejudice plus power. Personally, this argument never fully resonated with me. And to be clear, this was never the consensus among academics. Ibram X. Kendi, for example, rejects this view and dedicated an entire chapter in his book How to Be an Anti-Racist to Anti-White Racism. A more accurate distinction, in my opinion, is between racism and racial oppression. Anti-white racism is not oppression, as white people hold the power in society. But it's still racism. Because what is prejudice that is based on race, if not racism? Anti-white racism is harmful for two reasons. One, prejudice of any kind is wrong. And two, it perpetuates racial oppression because it upholds the notion that race is real, meaning there are qualitative differences between the races beyond skin color. The clips I played in the beginning were taken from a video titled The White Leftist Industrial Complex. It was a scathing critique of white leftist streamers like Bosch, Xanderhal, Keffels, as well as the black leftist streamer Shark, who Soul Bunny referred to as a sea slur, giving Candace Owens vibes. I'm not making this video for the purpose of defending these creators. I haven't watched much of Xander Hall, Keffels, or Shark's content. And while I don't hate Vosh, I'm not coming at this as a stan of these streamers. I was motivated to respond because of the overt racism in the name of anti-racism. And this video was signal boosted by two creators I otherwise respect, which was disappointing to say the least. It was honestly one of the worst video essays I've ever seen. Not only was it racist, it was an ill-constructed, incoherent mess. The fact that this word salad was described as a great video by an English teacher is baffling to me. I won't be getting into the insular Twitter drama discussed in this video because, for one, I don't go on Twitter. And again, I'm not making this video to defend the people she's criticizing. But I do have to explain some of the Twitter drama for context. Roslyn, the Asian woman previously clipped, tweeted about a white woman named Pippa Middlehurst who published a cookbook titled Dumplings and Noodles, insinuating that Pippa is a racist cultural appropriator. The tweet went viral and sparked a debate about cultural appropriation. I don't think cultural appropriation is a bogus concept. I see how corporations like Urban Outfitters and Victoria's Secret ripping off indigenous artists is harmful. But I also see many accusations of cultural appropriation as a bit of a stretch. Like, can we stop accusing Ariana Grande of Asian fishing? Regarding the dumplings and noodles controversy. Hi guys, I'm jumping in post-production to say that there is more to the story than Rosalind conveyed in this interview and in her original tweet. Judging by Rosalind's recap of the controversy, Pippa's book seemed like an example of appreciation, not appropriation. However, upon further investigation, Pippa does display ignorance and racism in her introduction. The food blog KV Eats makes a salient critique. You can pause to read. Roslyn got a lot of backlash for her tweet, and I'm not justifying any of the legitimate hate she received. Given the volume of responses, I'm sure she received racist comments, even from self-proclaimed leftists. But to label all leftists who disagreed with her tweet racist is insane. The clip I played in the beginning, which I'll play in full for context, was her reaction to leftists disagreeing with her insinuation that Pippa is a racist cultural appropriator. Fair warning, it's a long segment, but I want y'all to hear her speak without interruption before I add my commentary. Like, the reason I, I love your idea about doing this video is because it's a group effort. 
um, because it illustrates like that pattern of what these white leftist leftist streamers do and how they, you know, kind of weaponize their platform to just do racism on a daily basis for content. And it's like, if you like, especially with the white queers, it's it's really frustrating because white supremacy and queerphobia, transphobia, especially like it's all like intertwined and they don't understand this. Um, like everything's intertwined and white queers who are doing this, like, you know, doing racism for engagement bait, they don't understand how they're also shooting themselves in the foot. There was a part of me that wanted to believe that you know, self-proclaimed white leftists like understood what was happening and like what my issue was. Um, but at the same time, it's like, this is what white, white people do. They're going to, you know, circle the wagons and protect their own and essentially protect themselves. Um, I think because they are more, I think it's easier for them to identify with Pippa Middlehurst than it is to identify with you know, people like us. Um, you know, I think a lot, like, you know, even in like progressive circles, um, I think racism is still kind of like a taboo topic for, for them. And it's, they're very much like head in the sand. Um, you know, like racism ended in the nineties kind of thing. Disappointing that despite everything that happened, like with the George Floyd protest, everything that happened with like hashtag stop Asian hate, like they still could not fathom why I would be making fun of a white woman who wrote a book about Asian dumplings and noodles all of these white people and you know even some asian people were basically accusing me of attacking this this innocent white woman who was just appreciating the culture and it's like y'all like these these white people love this culture that we create this culture like these these ethnic foods these you know what television shows and movies they love the aesthetic they love the products that we put out but if it were up to them they would rather be the ones who are kind of like gatekeeping these cultures and presenting them in a way that's palatable for their like white friends, for their white audiences. They want to be the ones gaining the social capital. And it's crazy because, you know, these white leftists are supposedly anti-capitalist, but they don't, they don't and they can't see the issue that I was like kind of pointing out with my very unserious tweet. At the end of the day, it is a very like ego-based reaction for them to be like, oh, so white people can't cook noodles? They're so quick to this like knee-jerk reaction, this like defensive reaction. It just, it speaks volumes about their own principles and morals where it's more important for them to, you know, get their jokes in. It's more important for them to defend their right to be Asian food enjoyers or Asian food appreciators or whatever. I think what bothers me the most is that this one, or maybe two if they're disabled, this like one marginalization means that they're like completely infallible to any critique. Um, it means they think only white people can be queer. Only white people can be disabled. Um, like I've seen so much of that on Twitter where it's like, how can I be racist? I'm literally queer. It shows like this fundamental misunderstanding of like intersectionality, where if you're marginalized, it like gives you a pass or something. It's like a sticker that says like, I'm perfect. I'm, I'm oppressed, therefore I'm perfect. It's like they're using it as like a badge to say, oh, I'm, I'm progressive. Like my marginalization means I'm progressive and I can't be racist and it means I'm perfect. And it means that I'm the most important person in the room because I'm so marginalized. And like that again, like it's like this white need like this this need to be the one voice in the room or to be the voice in the room or to be the most right. It fails to account for, you know, racialized people who are also queer, who are also disabled, who are otherwise marginalized in, in different ways. And a lot of it is like, 
so much of it feels like they're just trying to avoid, they're trying to avoid any opportunity to do any self-reflection. If you understand that you're marginalized by your queerness, by your disability, you understand, like you have to understand that all of these oppressive systems are rooted in white supremacy. And if you're not willing to reckon with white supremacy, you're not actually for liberation. You're, what you're for is assimilating into the power structure that keeps racialized people at the bottom. White leftists are not our allies. They are not our accomplices. They are, they are not for liberation. They are for their own profit and um, for, you know, building their own social capital and positioning themselves as the experts, as the, you know, there, you know, like the whole, this whole thing has just made me realize that like white people are not serious. The only thing they're serious about is this like individualist need to be, to be visible basically, um, to be the funniest in the room, to be the most, you know, progressive in the room. It just kind of made me realize that this is just like a facade to them. This is just a game. They have no like actual, stakes in the game like they it, it's basically like this is like the the idea of like liberation is not is not something that they're really thinking of they're basically just treating this like as a sport or some kind of something like that once their feelings are hurt like in, in like once they get their feelings hurt they will revert to their whiteness like in a in the snap of a finger like and like god forbid like i show a bit of vulnerability and like show my emotions um about everything and like when it comes to like like when it comes to like women of color like pointing out anything that's that's wrong with the world we're always angry we're always like hysterical we're always like irrational and especially when it comes to like making fun of white women like it's like we've committed this like this this cardinal sin like don't don't make fun of white women like you're you're gonna get the you're gonna make us look bad and it's like i don't i don't care <laughs> it's white people making these spaces unsafe for us and that's not us being insular it's them refusing to learn or understand or otherwise like meaningfully engage with any anti-racist theory or any anti-racist like praxis racism is very serious and it can be extreme white people should treat it seriously but they have this like stereotypical idea of racism that it's the very for them it's like a very high bar to meet you know they don't see that calling any black leftist a psyop. They don't understand why that's problematic because they only see the clan hoods as a valid form of racism. They're not dealing with like the root, the root cause of these oppressions. And it's kind of like why we keep going in this like endless circle it's because we have to keep explaining to white people that yes, white supremacy is actually at the root of everything. It's at the root of misogyny. It's at the root of queer phobia. It's at the root of transphobia. It's at the root of ableism. Sometimes it feels like white people are just like being dense on purpose. It's like their God-given right to be dense and to keep us trapped in this cycle of explaining to white people that white supremacy is at the root of everything. Okay, that was a lot. Where do I even begin? I guess I'll start by pointing out the irony of her calling white leftists arrogant, while confidently and wrongly claiming that white supremacy is the root of all evil. Never mind the fact that race is a social construct that wasn't invented until the 1500s. Patriarchy, xenophobia, homophobia, and let's not forget speciesism, all predate white supremacy. Like, yes, these systems of oppression are intertwined, but they don't all trace back to white supremacy. The actual root of these problems is unjustified hierarchy and discrimination based on arbitrary characteristics. She makes a lot of baseless assumptions about white leftist motivations and intentions. She says that we refuse to listen and reflect or engage with any anti-racist theory. 
Apparently, we have such a shallow understanding of racism that we only see the Klan as racist. These are leftists she's referring to. Leftists who talk about subtle and structural racism. Leftists who acknowledge concepts like intersectionality, microaggressions, and cultural appropriation. Just because we disagree with your specific example of cultural appropriation doesn't mean we only see overt racism as racism. This is the narcissism of small differences. I reckon there are probably members of my audience who view Pippa Middlehurst as kinda cringe. But even if you view this as a legitimate example of cultural appropriation, surely you can acknowledge that Rosalind's reaction was disproportionate. Again, I now recognize this as a legitimate example of cultural appropriation, but not because Pippa is white and wrote a book about dumplings and noodles, but because of the racist rhetoric in her intro. She says that white queers believe they're infallible and above criticism because they're queer, which shows a fundamental misunderstanding of intersectionality, because they fail to account for racialized people who are also queer. What? This is such projection. She's the one demonstrating a fundamental misunderstanding of intersectionality. Her idea of intersectionality is identical to the right-wing misrepresentation of intersectionality. That the more oppression boxes you tick off, the more valuable your opinion is. And she's the one failing to account for racialized queer people, the ones who disagree with her toxic id poll garbage. Most white queer people acknowledge their white privilege. Or at least most white queer leftists do. While she's calling out the supposed racism of white leftists, she's being blatantly racist by essentializing white leftists as egotistical and not serious. She's expressing the belief that white people possess distinct characteristics, we're self-serving, to distinguish us as inferior to people of color in terms of our ability to show allyship. This is racist as fuck. And it runs counter to her goals of dismantling white supremacy, because it maintains the belief that there are qualitative differences between races beyond skin color, which is the fundamental belief underlying white supremacy. You can't fight racism with racism. White people may lack the unique perspective that comes with lived experience as a racialized person, but we have the capacity for empathy and understanding. I don't think it's necessarily racist for people of color to make fun of white people. White people are systemically advantaged, so pointing out ignorance or bigotry displayed by many white people is punching up. But Rosalind fails to demonstrate the ignorance or bigotry that's supposedly on display here. She says when it comes to women of color pointing out anything that's wrong with the world, we're viewed as angry, hysterical, and irrational. It's true that this stereotype is often wielded at women of color by racist white people. It's racist to call a woman of color aggressive and angry when she's expressing righteous anger over legitimate grievances. It's not racist, however, to call a woman of color irrational if she's being irrational. I'm not saying leftists can't possibly be racist, but again, she hasn't demonstrated actual racism from leftists here. Next, I want to address something Soul Bunny said in her intro. Before I dive in, I need to define some terms and give some context for the foolishness you'll hear. Woke school, tender queer, and identity politics, short into it poll, are dog whistles that they enjoy weaponizing against marginalized people. Woke school being an offshoot of woke used disingenuously by right wingers. Like Erica Badu said, it's just another way to say black or thug, let alone woke being AAVE. Tender queer is a word that has different meanings person to person. But the way I see it used is equivalent to a queer version of woke school. Lastly, idpol, or better known as identity politics, is the most mask off racist term used by these flock. The civil rights movement is identity politics. Fighting for the right for gay marriage in 2015 is identity politics. The fight for Roe v. Wade is identity politics. Black trans people fighting to combat the disgusting reality of our high murder rate is identity politics. When leftists critique identity politics, we're not talking about identity politics as defined by Soul Bunny here. We're talking about the fallacious appeal to identity in place of a sound argument. I have an entire video where I discuss the harms of this toxic form of identity politics that is quite pervasive on both the left and the right. What Soul Bunny is doing here is a Mott and Bailey. She makes a bunch of fallacious appeals to identity that are difficult to defend, the Bailey. So she makes sure to include a definition of identity politics that's much easier to defend, the Mott, that she can retreat to if challenged. 
She's conflating leftism with this toxic form of id poll when she says that identity politics is a right-wing dog whistle. This is dangerous because deploying toxic id poll is an incredibly weak argumentation strategy. And if we want the left to win, we need to deploy strong arguments. Divorcing leftism from toxic id poll is crucial if we want to make tangible changes for marginalized people. Lastly, I want to talk about the importance of listening to marginalized people. What this means and what it doesn't mean. Listening to marginalized people is very important because lived experience offers a crucial perspective on these political issues. But to seek true understanding, you have to listen to a variety of perspectives. Because marginalized people are not a monolith. They don't all share the same political opinions regarding their own oppression. When people like Soul Bunny and Rosalind say, listen to people of color, what they're actually saying is, but only the ones who agree with me, the others are sea slurs. As a white person, I'm faced with a dilemma. Who's right? I can't use identity as a metric, because if I were to do that, I would judge both opinions as equally valid. And they can't both be valid if they're contradictory. So where does that leave me? The only metric that makes sense to use is the strength of the argument. Listen to marginalized people means listen to a variety of voices to gain a more holistic perspective. It does not mean bow down and cuck yourself to people like Soul Bunny. I've been called out for racism in the past, for microaggressions, and for some more overtly racist rhetoric. I was a cringy anti-woke edgelord, okay? Life and totally awful My closet is chock full of stuff that is vaguely shitty All of it was perfectly lawful Just not very thoughtful at all And just really and I'm really fucking sorry But I've grown up and I've done a lot of self-reflection And I've realized that some of those accusations of racism were legitimate But I look back on some of the stuff I said and I still don't see the racism I like to think that I'm capable of change if presented with a reasonable argument. But I'm not just going to accept an accusation of racism at face value because it came from a person of color. Expecting white people to take your shitty arguments at face value is anti-white racism. And racism of any kind does not promote racial equality. You're not helping the cause, you're giving the right fodder. When conservatives say that the left hates white people, and anti-racist actually means anti-white, this is a straw man. But when you say shit like, white people are not our allies, white people are not serious, you're a walking, talking straw man. Thank you so much for watching, please give this video a thumbs up, and definitely go watch my video on toxic identity politics. Alright, peace out. I've been called out on my racism in the past. I wear me eat them, I wonder where me eat them. When me tell them, say me not eat no fish, no, no meat now. I wear me eat them, I wonder where me yam. When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan man. I wear me eat them, I wonder where me eat them.